thrilled to welcome Ann Patchett, recipient of the Penn Faulkner Award and the Orange Prize for Fiction, now the Women's Prize for Fiction, and author of numerous novels, including Bel Canto, State of Wonder, as well as several books of nonfiction. She was named one of the 100 most influential people in the world by Time Magazine and is co-owner of Parnassus Books in Nashville, Tennessee. She is joined by Brooke Warner, author of Write On Sisters and publisher of She Writes Press and Spark Press. Please welcome Anne and Brooke. Hi, everybody. And hello, Anne. My goodness, I am so thrilled to be here. I'm Brooke Warner, everyone. I'm your moderator. Uh, and it's just absolutely thrilled to be in conversation with Anne. I got the notification about 30 hours ago that I got to do this. And, um, and I've just been, your voice has been in my ears all day because I've been looking up past interviews and just kind of soaking up your goodness. So I'm just so happy to be here with you. Well, thank you, Kiski, for the introduction. And also thank you, Brooke, for doing this, because as I said to you in the green room, it really is just nice to talk to a human, especially <laughs> on these pandemic Zoom things. You know, it's strange enough to be sitting there talking to your computer, but if there's nobody on the other end, it feels super strange. So thanks oh. for being the smart, warm <laughs> receiving person on the other end of this. Absolutely my honor. And uh, I thought we would start, it, the tonight's event is called The Ties That Bind and Patch It on Family, Fortune, and the Search for Self, which is such a broad amount of stuff that we can talk about. But obviously it made me think about the Dutch house and the fact that that story is so much about these two kids that have something happen to them that they never get over. And I wanted to ask you about what it was like, or, or I guess living with Danny and Maeve all that time, what you learned about that experience of not getting over something. You know, it's, it's really funny that when you're writing a novel, there are just all sorts of things that you don't see. You know, it's like, I, I do really believe I bring half and the reader brings half. And it's not that I sat down and thought, I'm going to write a novel about what happens when you don't get over things. And there was a way, I mean, I was writing about a brother and sister relationship and I was writing about a long life and a life of change and about the balance of having nothing, having everything, having everything, having nothing, working your way back to having everything again, just the, the, rise and fall of fortune's tide. And it wasn't until the book came out and I started getting mail from readers and people were coming to the bookstore and talking to me and saying, you know, this was a book that really helped me lay down my old hurts. This was a book that really made me think, what have I been chewing on my whole life and carrying with me that I need to let go of? And and yeah, I completely get that that's a big part of the story, but it wasn't what I was setting out to do. And it was so meaningful to me. The, the really the nicest thing that's happened since this book came out was I was at Parnassus one day and these two women who were like late 20s, early 30s came in and they were sisters. And they said that they hadn't spoken to each other for like five years and they had both read the Dutch house independently and they reached out to each other and said, uh, we have to just get over this. Like life's too short. We've got to lay down our hurt and we have to come together. And they lived in different cities and they made a trip to Nashville to thank me. Wow. That, uh, that's beautiful. Right. Right. <laughs> so I sort of feel like, okay, my work here is done. Right. <laughs> that one thing. Um, well, I, I want to ask about something totally different, which is about villains, because interestingly, in a couple of your interviews, this question of villains came up. And I was struck by something you said in the Louise Erdrich interview, where you interviewed her about this idea that you might explore the kind of stepmother you were afraid of being with Andrea. And so was that something that also came about accidentally or was that more of part of the purpose that drove you into the exploration of this stepmother? So the way I write is I really think a book all the way through in my head. I don't take notes. It can, it just changes and changes. It can take place over the course of a year. 
when I, or two years, when I first started this story, it was a story about Elna. It was a story about Danny and Maeve's mother. Mm -hmm. Uh, That is a whole other kettle of fish. But I was on book tour for Commonwealth, my last novel. And then when I got home, I was interviewing Zadie Smith. One of my jobs at Parnassus is I'm the person who interviews the authors, you know, a lot of the time, not all the time. And I adore Zadie uh, and I'm a huge fan. And we were talking about Swing Time, which certainly was being received as a very autobiographical novel. So we're up on stage just gotten off tour. I'm just starting to think about the novel that I want to write next. And I ask her if the book Swing Time is autobiographical. And she said, yes, but I'm not the daughter, which if you read the book, you would definitely think she was the daughter. She said, I'm the mother. And she said, I'm not the mother in this book. I'm not that mother to my children. That is the mother I am afraid of being. That is the idea Like that's the kind of mother that I could be. And I want to make sure I'm never that kind of mother. And so it's very autobiographical because I was drawing on my fear. And people think that writing autobiographically means drawing on things that actually happened. But what we're afraid of and what we long for actually can be a much larger part of our psyche than what happened. And so at that moment, I'm sitting up on a stage with Zadie Smith. I thought, oh, I want to write about the kind of stepmother that I was afraid of being. Now, my stepchildren are way grown, right? They're in their 40s. <laughs> I haven't had this fear for a very, very long time. But when I first met them 26 years ago, I was so afraid that I was going to let them down because they had been through a lot and my parents had married and married other people and you know we just we just all marry and divorce in my family uh, <laughs> and so it's like our hobby it's our brand um so i was able to tap into that even though it was something that i hadn't felt in 23 years or whatever i could really pull up what was what would be the worst thing i could have done as a stepmother wow i could just access that immediately so i could be andrea I could, I could be the villain. And oddly, my body of work is so devoid of villains because I tend to be very sympathetic and I, my villains always turn into sympathetic characters. But drawing villainy from myself and from knowing, okay, what, you know, what was I afraid of? What was the worst thing I could have done as a stepmother? And I was actually a a very nice stepmother, you know, my stepchildren really <laughs> like me. Uh, we're all, we're all good, but I could pull that up right away. And, and that was how Andrea came about. It's actually a great organizing principle in some way for, for people just to step fully into any given character. And I just wanted to ask you about that with fiction, because it's an interesting question in this autobiographical novel stuff comes about a lot and I teach memoir. And Mm. so I wanted to ask you about the, the fact of autobiographical fiction, because Commonwealth you've said is autobiographical fiction. Don't you think all novels are to some extent, I mean, using this, um, what you're talking about right now, like you're able to step into any given character. And so Sure. Yeah, I I guess I'm just curious about if you think that most people are bringing their autobiographical stories to almost every fiction that they write in some capacity. You know, Commonwealth is a great example. My mother, when she read it, said none of it happened and all of it's true. Right. And that's, that's really the case. The things that happened to those kids did not happen to us, but the emotional heft of my childhood, my my sibling's childhood is really in that book. I took it and I dumped it all in that book. There are a lot of characters in my fiction that if you said, you know, how are you like Cyril or mm-hmm. how are you like Fluffy? I mean, I would have to really, really think of it. But I be- and I'm sure I could come up with something, but nothing springs to mind. But what I always think of is we are all a pack of cards, we are all 52 cards and you could deal hands for the rest of your life on earth and you're not going to deal exactly the same hand, 
but those are your 52 cards. No matter how you arrange them, chances are I am not going to get another card. I'm not going to get a 53rd card. If I'm lucky, I won't lose any. You know, you you just have to work with what you've got and and what you've got is who you are. And and the reason that I wrote Commonwealth is that I felt like I had been putting so much energy in my writing life into making sure that none of the characters looked like me or my family and none of the circumstances were like my circumstances. And so you know, we'll go to a home for unwed mothers or a blues bar in Mississippi or a terrorist takeover in Peru, or we'll, we'll go to the Amazon. And I just thought, Patchett, you are spending so much energy making trees, right? Making costumes and sets and little birds. And like, what if I took all of the energy that I put into making sets and costumes uh, and locations, and just put that into the story. And that's what I did with Commonwealth, in hopes that I was really going to free myself in some way of that repeating theme. And I feel like to some extent, I kind of did. Although again, it's my pack of cards. <laughs> well, that's interesting that you say that, because I guess every story has all of the, the, the sets are important, and particularly in Dutch House, because this house is a character. I mean, it's extraordinary. And I would love to, well, you mentioned in the green room about the photo. I think we have to see the the picture, if you don't mind standing and showing us the, the front cover, because I wanted everybody to see that. And I wanted to ask you about the, the story of the cover, but also the story of the house. So let's yes. see. Okay. There's, so there's, I'm in my den. There's Maeve. Um, big, right? Like it's a big <laughs> oh, painting. I um, absolutely adore it. Yeah. So I, it's a twofold question because it's the, the art and the house to me seem to be these set elements of the book and they're extraordinary and as important, I think, as the characters in some way. So if you could just tell us a little bit about the story of the cover and the story of the Dutch house itself. Yes, I'd love to. Uh, so... <laughs> I have, um, I'm 57, and I published my first book, I think when I was 27, 27, around in there somewhere. Uh, and I've had this huge journey with covers in my life and with getting covers I like and covers I don't like and people listening to me and people not listening to me. And I've been at several different publishing houses over the years. And I realized at when I wrote the book Run, um, which was just a really, really hard cover situation, that you don't get the right cover unless you figure out what you want and you ask for it. And I always think it's like your birthday. If you don't know what you want, don't expect anyone else to figure out what you want. Uh, so you can't just have people bringing you things, presenting you with covers and be continually disappointed by them. So since then, I have been tremendously proactive with my covers. When I finished the Dutch house, I knew absolutely I didn't want there to be a house on the cover. I didn't want there to be a door or window or anything because it's so important that the Dutch house is the most beautiful book, the most beautiful, the most beautiful house you've ever seen, right? Mm -hmm. It's the house in your imagination. There are actually bizarrely few details about the Dutch house, just a couple of weird things. And a lot of those things are repeated over and over again. Um, so there couldn't be a house. And, and there's this painting of Maeve in the book. And it's, it's important to the story. And I wanted Maeve to be on the cover, that painting. I wanted the reader to have the experience of reading along in the story and then getting to the point where that painting appears and thinking, wait a minute, you know, wait, wait, and flipping back to the cover. Oh my God, that's the painting that's hanging on their wall. Um, a lot of things figured into that aspect. One of the things that drives me insane is that if there is a picture of a woman on the cover of a book, she is almost always with her back to, to the viewer or she's wearing a big hat or her face is obscured um, or sometimes chopped off. I had that actually with one of my books in the UK 
they just had the torso, like the, the book stop right there. It drives me nuts. There can't be the direct gaze of a woman on the cover of the book. And the thinking is that the woman who is reading the book wants to imagine herself as the character. Mm-hmm. And so if you have a, a front, front on full face direct gaze, then, then the reader can't inhabit the character in the same way to which I say that is ridiculous. Um, so I wanted this portrait and I wanted it to be a girl with a direct gaze, just like it is in the novel. I called my editor and the director of the art department. I said, this is what I want. We looked archivally for the painting. I was thinking something sort of John Singer Sargent, couldn't find it, couldn't get the right thing. And I have a friend here in Nashville named Noah Satterstrom, who is just a fantastic painter. And I said, I need a 10 year old girl with black hair in a red coat painted in 1950, but in the style of 1910 by a Scotsman. And he said, okay, (laughs) all right, got it. And he did that painting in four days. That's amazing. Well, it's gorgeous. And I do, I love the direct gaze. It's so compelling. So I'm with you on that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for the story and and lucky you to have Noah. Um, I want to pivot kind of hard because I have a question about Parnassus. I want to make sure that we, there's so many questions that I have and, you know, you're, you're obviously best known for being an author, but you're very famous in the book community for being a bookseller and owning a bookstore. Um, And I wanted to ask you about the intersection of those identities, because I sort of have this image, like you said, of these women who traveled across the country to kind of come fangirl you in your bookstore. So what is how do you do it? How do you run a bookstore and like do fans come to Parnassus to try to get you to sign books and blurb their books? And, you know, how does one exist as a very famous author and well-loved bookstore owner? Um, Yeah, I always say I'm America's most famous retailer now. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I don't work at the store. I don't run the store. I have a a partnership with a woman named Karen Hayes, we have a 50-50 partnership and, and Karen and I employ Karen to run the store. Uh, when we were introduced by a mutual friend as two women who were interested in opening a bookstore, our deal was I would pay for everything and she would do all the work. And that's, that's kind of our division of labor. I'm, I'm the spokesperson, uh, especially, gosh, since the pandemic has started, I who don't have a cell phone and have never once looked at social media. I now do all these Instagram videos for the bookstore, which is hysterical because now people come up to me in the grocery store and they're like, I follow you on Instagram. And I'm like, I actually don't know what that means. Uh, So lovely dresses and it's very, very cute. Yes. It's working. And, And it, listen, it moves, it moves books like a 20 second video in which I say, here, I will lean forward and. <laughs> dogs. Fabulous Tashin book about dogs is in fact exactly what you want during the pandemic because it's calming and beautiful. And if you can't really hold on to a narrative, you could just look at dogs. Walter dogs. Chambon, dogs. I will be very yes. pleased with this segment. <laughs> That's what I now do for a living. I, I like uh, put on a cocktail dress and I nuzzle books. <laughs> um, oh, great. It is really shocking to me that every time I'm in the store and I go out on the floor, there's somebody there who says, I came from Sweden to meet you. And I'm like, what the hell? Why did you think I was going to be here today? You know, like, Or there'll be this giant book group. And they're like, we we drove for two straight days, trading off at the wheel. They're like, why didn't you call and tell me you were coming? Uh, my sister works at the bookstore, and you know, sometimes she'll call me and she's like, you've got to get over here right away. You know, like, the Germans are here. You have to come. <laughs> um, so and sighting. People are, you know, people are completely lovely and. 
a lot of times people will say, we just wanted to come to your store and it was fine if, if you were there or if you weren't there. Uh, but it has become a real pilgrimage. I was curious about that. Yeah. And it, it is really, I mean, I think it's exciting for the book community to, in terms of the visibility that you're giving to independent bookstores. And, and I don't think people out in the public necessarily realize that, you know, that it does have kind of a ripple effect and you're so supportive of other bookstore owners. So I just wanted to acknowledge that and thank you as yeah. a publisher coming from the publisher hat. Um, one, the other thing, a point of curiosity, I mean, I, I wanted to ask you about intimacy because I mean, you just strike me as like an incredibly intimate person. It's, it shows up in your writing. When people talk about your books, it, they are talking about it, things being, you know, touching and moving and intimate. And I know people have questions about this most recent Harper's piece that just published. When I said I was interviewing you, several people said, have you read this incredible story? And what I took away from the story with Suki was, this for people who haven't read it, you must. I mean, it's a long piece, but I took away this just total abandon, you know, of of turning yourself over in a sense to this potential friendship that um, you know that was really intimate, you know, and 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 unexpected for you. And so, for people who don't know, Suki is Tom Hanks's assistant, and who you befriended and basically bring to your house to have her chemotherapy treatment. So I, I was curious about intimacy in your life, you know, the degree to which you do stuff like that, <laughs> you know, just invite total strangers into your life and, and what you think, you know, intimacy in your personality, like how it informs your fiction. Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, you know, Intimacy in, in that sense or openness, you are who you are, right? Like there are just so many things I don't do. And, and in a way I have a big life and in a way I have a very small life, but like I don't watch television and I don't, again, the social media, the phone, the, all these things that it sort of move society along now. I'm, I don't do any of that. So my life in compared to the lives of many people, and I don't have children, and I don't have a job outside the home. You know, my life is, is very simple and clean in many ways. And I think that that maybe makes it easier for me to invite people into my life. I'm also married to somebody from Mississippi. You know, I'm married to the friendliest guy in the world. So if I come home and say, oh, hey, Carl, I invited a total stranger to, who has pancreatic cancer to come and live with us for, a, you know, an indeterminate amount of time, he is always going to say, you are amazing. That is so great. I'm so proud of you. Boy, this is exactly what I love about you. This is going to be wonderful. I'm going to help you in any way possible. I mean, that's really something. Um, the number of people who sleep in our house, and part of it is it's just a good house. It's a house that's really set up for house guests. But a lot of times authors, either authors that I know, sometimes authors that I don't know, come and spend the night. And by the time the event is over and there's been a dinner and we get home, Carl's gone to sleep. And then he wakes up and leaves in the morning before that author is awake. And then he'll pick up the book six months later and say, do you know this person? Do you know Ed Weech? Do you know Ed Weech Dondicott? I was like, yeah, she's slept in our house. Really? She said, did I meet her? No, you didn't meet her. Um, so anyway, it's part of it is circumstantial. Part of it is DNA. I, I also always think part of it is that I don't have children. Mm. And, and I think that whatever energy, and, I, and I'm not a maternal person, um, but there's say this, this energy um, that for most women, or many women goes into having children and raising children. What an enormous amount of energy that must take. Incomprehensible amount of energy. 
And I, I still have that energy, right? Like I can spend it on other people. It, I always think that, you know, there should be a special tax on people who don't have <laughs> children. We, people who don't have children should always have to pay the check because they didn't have to pay their babysitter and they, they didn't have to pay their doctor bills and their school bills and you know all of these things. It's like people without children have all of that extra money and extra time and extra energy. So that's part of why. Well, and I'm curious too, I mean, you give, you're talking about other people, but there's also the space to give that to your fiction to give that energy to your fiction. Well, and I mean, you don't have an only written fiction. I mean, obviously that this is nonfiction that we're actually talking about. Um, but yeah, no, thank you. It's an interesting perspective. And I did want to ask a question about Tom Hanks because in that piece, <laughs> you, you call it a lark, you know, that you asked him to uh, do your audiobook on a lark. And I thought, well, that's uh, quite, quite a lot of audacity, you know, and it was the one place where, um, that, that I wanted you to unpack a little bit more than you actually did. You're like, I just decided to email Tom Hanks and ask him to do my audiobook. And so what, what is that? What is that? And how can we be so audacious to ask those kinds of questions? Um, yeah, you know, I had actually, I had actually asked two other people who turned me down. Oh, other third, so third choice. Yeah, he was my third choice, <laughs> which is not in the piece, nor have I ever mentioned to him. Um, and I, I do really believe if you don't play, you don't win. If you don't, you might not get what you ask for, but you are really not going to get it if you don't ask. And, and I know Tom and, you know, we're friends in a in a very friendly, loose definition of friendship. We know each other. And I didn't in any way think that he would be offended if I asked. And also a friend of mine had sent me a Carly Rae Jepsen video in which Tom appears as a character in a Carly Rae Jepsen video. It's hysterical. <laughs> but well, he was in a Carly Rae Jepsen video. You know, I had that moment. I was like, well, okay, it wouldn't be a huge stretch. It's not like I'm asking him to be in my music video. I just figured that he would say no and that it was, and that he wouldn't be offended by my asking. And so I was going to ask. And, and he wrote back and said, oh my gosh, that sounds like so much fun. Yeah, send me the book. Let's see if this works. It's amazing. I, it, it does strike me. I mean, I, it was a thing, you know, I mean, the fact that he did your audiobook was kind of making the rounds. And I imagine that the audiobook sales are just through the roof because of him. Yeah. yeah. And it's also <laughs> brilliant. I mean, when I meet somebody who says, oh, I listened to the book on audio, it makes me so happy because I feel like the book, the Dutch house, that was the best I could do. That was the very, very best I, book I could write. There's me. And then Tom Hanks comes in with all of his ability, the very best he could do. And then you get something that is just exponentially so much larger mm -hmm. than my talent or his talent. I mean, it really is a better book if you listen to it. Agreed. I listened to it and I absolutely loved it. And um, he's he's such a treat to listen to. So uh, I back to this question of the Harper's piece, because you, it's clearly a story about friendship. And the first book I ever read of yours was actually Truth and Beauty. And yeah. I loved that. And I, I came to it because I had read Autobiography of a Face. And then someone said, have you read this book by Ann Patchett about her friendship with Lucy? So that is how I made my way to you. And in reading the piece about Suki, I thought of how you write about friendship. And then I was listening to some of your interviews and you were talking about the fact that you've written about all these different kinds of sibling relationships, you know, adoptive and uh, step and now these biological ones. And so those relationships are overlapping, of course, you know, siblings and friendships. And I, I just wanted to ask you kind of an open-ended question about what draws you to write about friendships, what draws you to write about siblings. Well, siblings are interesting to me. Families are interesting to me because you can't get away from them. I, I love confinement. 
in fiction. I love setting up something where people are trapped uh, and they have to, you know, figure out how they feel. That's just a really interesting set of parameters to put on a book, trap everybody together. (laughs) If you are in love with someone, if you're married to someone, you can get rid of them. You know, you really can create a circumstance where you never see that person again. Siblings, not so much, you know, parents, not so much. Even if you really, really hate them and have some horrible break with them, at some point, chances are there's going to be another moment where they come back into your life. Uh, we're, so it's confinement. Mm-hmm. And that's very intriguing to me. As far as friendship is concerned, friendship is perhaps my genius. Uh, I am a really good friend. I have really good friends. I, you know, my my closest friend is somebody that I met in second grade, mm-hmm. right? When we talk three times a week. Um, uh, so I'm just really good at that. And it's important. And I like to continually put that out in the world to say, this is something that's good for you. This is something that really matters uh, and praise it. It's been so important to me. And it's wonderful to read about friendship because it makes you honor your own friendships and want to be a better friend. And I I did leave that piece feeling that way. So it's, if if that was the intention too, it was lovely. Um, I'm going to say one more thing about friendship. I wrote a piece when actually when the Dutch house came out, real simple magazine asked me to write a piece for the publication of the book. And I said, Oh, I want to write a piece about my friend Tavia, who is my, you know, my oldest friend um, as if I was writing a celebrity profile. Right. But just like my regular, she is my pal. And at the end, when I turned it in, they said, well, you know, the problem with this is you guys didn't fight. You, you don't talk about when you didn't speak for two years or when you both were in love with the same guy and you broke up and split apart or when you were jealous, she was really pretty and you were really successful. And, you know, what about your jealousy? And I was like, no, that didn't happen. It didn't happen. And they said, well, it's going to make our readers feel inadequate. So you need to put something in so they don't feel bad about themselves. And I said, listen, if Tavia had breast cancer, if she, if she was dying of breast cancer, you would publish this exactly mm. as it is, because our punishment would be that she's going to die. Um, but if, if she's not going to die and, she, and we're both in, in good health and we've been really good friends and we've never hated each other or been jealous or you know, undermined each other, this idea that in women's friendship, there has to be the dark side. Either it's the fight or it's the death. And I said, you either you can run it like this or I'm going to pull it. I don't want to make your readers uncomfortable, but I'm not going to lie uh, and say that we were something that we were not. But, but the, the myth in society that women can't be true to one another, you know, that we can't be deep, passionate, lifelong friends is absurd. It really is absurd. Yes, because women supporting women. I mean, that's the other thing is reading these kinds of pieces and you think of your own best friends and how you're there. It's really lovely. So, well, did they run it? Yeah, they did. Good. (laughs) Good for them. And also, I've had so many shout outs from Sookie's friends all along who, who said, you know, I want to be you. I want to be the one there. I want to be taking care of her. I want to be with her every day. And I'm so glad you are. And I'm so grateful to you. And you're so lucky that you're the one who gets to be there with her. And that's the truth. Well, um, that's really beautiful. Yeah. And she makes you want to be a better person. I mean, she makes you want to be a better person, but she makes us want to be a better person. And so it was just lovely. Um, I, I, I'm also a fan of Liz Gilbert's and I wanted to ask you the story of that she tells in big magic about your idea, you know, this, this, that you had this very similar idea for a novel, which you of course go on to publish, which is state of wonder and her idea kind of 
withers and dies. And Liz, of course, is, you know, more very mystical. I mean, I don't know how mystical you are, actually. And I was curious about that experience on your side. You know, if if you felt that there was this, you know, receiving of an idea and, and if you... I don't want to say buy into, but that is the words that are coming to my mouth into that concept of ideas being there for the plucking and, and that there are people who are meant to tell these stories. You know, Liz and I are very good friends. And um, I think that we say the exact same thing in very different language, which is there are things that you can't explain and work is all. <laughs> and she gives a lot more credit verbally to to the spirit and I give a lot more credit to the chair and just sitting there Um, and yet at the end of the day I think we do very similar things and I will say that everything that she says in Big Magic is true and she and it's a story that I used to tell all the time she wrote it she sent it to me she was like do you sign off on this absolutely but, but there is another chapter of that story, which is after her partner, Rhea, died, um, I had a dream about a plot of a novel that was, I've never had anything like it. I mean, it was just absolutely clear. And I knew precisely what I was going to write next. And... I got up in the morning and I wrote this whole thing down. I mean, it was, it was an amazing experience, nothing else like it. And two days later, Liz called me and she was driving across Texas or something. She was just doing some giant long haul drive. And we were talking and she was talking about what she wanted to write next and what she was struggling with. And she was saying, you know, I just can't get it. I, I mean, I'm seeing this and this and this, but I, I can't figure it out. And I was like, oh, oh screwed up again, it came to me. I, I was like, it, this, this is what happened. This is what is going to happen in the book. And I told her the whole thing. And she said, oh, my God. And it had to do with Raya. And, you know, had, it had to do with all of that. Uh, and I said, no, it's just, you know, it was like just it was just one of those misdelivered plots again. This is yours. This isn't mine. And she said, oh, I can't. I can't take this from you. You're so excited about it. I can't take it away from you. And I said, you know, this idea and I have been together for 48 hours. We, I'm not attached. I don't care. It's totally yours. Oh, awesome relationship. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not going to miss it. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know to what extent Liz and I operate on the same wavelength, um, but there definitely is something there. She wrote me the most beautiful letter after that piece in Harper's came out. And, and Liz was very present because Rhea had died of pancreatic cancer. Mm -hmm. Uh, She was very present. And I, when I was thinking about this piece and working on it and she said, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here crying for all the reasons, you know, I'm crying. Um, But she said, I'm also crying for a reason that you don't know, which is that this is a piece about you and Carl. And she said, I've never had words for for who you and Carl are and and sort of the space you occupy. And she said, you've you've put that into words for me. And that's why I'm crying. Oh, that's so touching. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for answering that. I mean, it, it strikes me that you do, you you do believe in the mysticism and, and I believe it too. I mean, it's, it's just, yeah, the, the articulation of it from Liz's point, but it's, it's a really beautiful shared experience that you two have had more than once. Yeah, exactly. So there you go. How can you explain it? Um, we're going to move into the audience Q and A because there are so many people and there are tons, I can just see the questions coming in and Kiski has questions. And so I'm feeling the pressure of, of making sure that we tend to those, but I, there's one final question. I just really wanted to ask you, there was an interview, um, with you and Alan Alda on his podcast, and you said something that plot is out of fashion. And I, I totally agree with you, but I just wanted to hear your take on it. And, and, and also, I mean, then what, I mean, do you feel good about being a champion of plotting for all of the writers out there? 
<laughs> well, it's, I can't remember exactly what I said, but that people keep telling me plot is out of fashion. I keep hearing <laughs> that plot is out of fashion and I just don't care. I don't care. I love plot. Yeah. I just That's apologetic. Perfect. Yeah. I love a good story. And every now and then I read a novel that it doesn't interest itself in plot and it works. And there are people that like one thing and people that like another thing. And I <laughs> all, whenever I think about writing, I think we are all little chips in the giant mosaic in which the mosaic is reflecting human life. Mm. And I am not reflecting human li- all of human life. I get a lot of criticism for being too much of a Pollyanna, for being too positive, for not having enough villains, enough serial killers. I, I cannot tell you, anybody, who, uh, anybody out there who writes, who wants to write better, who wants to be a better reader, a better person, a better thinker about literature, George Saunders' book, which came out yesterday, called A Swim in a Pond in the Rain, is for you. Such a spectacular book about the Russian short story in which he's breaking it all down. And the review in the New York Times today, the book just, the book meant so much to me. It Mm -hmm. it really made me so excited about reading and about writing. And the review in the Times today says, you know, George Saunders is just too... He's too enthusiastic and he's too positive and he's, I don't know, I don't think I really trust him. And I thought, George Saunders is not speaking for humanity, right? Right. You know, he's a big hearted, (laughs) open, positive guy. Me too. George and I, we have the same birthday. We're very much alike. Um, I was going to say, I mean, you're practically famous for being, you know, kind and warm and good. And that's why people come to your fiction. And so um, I I love it that you're absolutely unapologetic about it. And that's what people are craving when they're coming to your writing. So, yeah, right. So, you know, plenty of books about serial killers. They are (laughs) really well represented, but just not in my fiction because nobody is going to represent the entirety of human experience. Right. And those books are easy to find too. Okay, guys. Good. Well, oh, thank you. There's Sparky, everybody. He's okay, wanting he's to make an appearance. Just... <laughs> <laughs> That's our transition. Cue the Q and A. Cue the dog. <laughs> Kiski, do we have a lot of questions? Yes, we do. <laughs> um, people are loving this, you guys. Great job. And and funnily enough, we have an event with George this Friday. So that is just perfectly oh, ties in. <laughs> lucky you. That's so great. And I'm interviewing him next week. So yeah, oh, maybe you walk yours and get some like tips. Double whammy. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Um, well, I will move on to some of these great questions we received from our audience. Uh, the first one from Carol. She says, there's often something shocking that is revealed in your books. Do you know ahead of time or, or do you follow the characters and are shocked yourself by what unfolds? Do you envision the whole story? Oh, I know ahead of time. (laughs) I do. I work the whole thing out in my head and I change my mind about some things and I get some things wrong, but yeah, I know where I'm going. You write it all down. Like when you say in your head, you don't actually mean you do. You're remembering it. Wow. That's incredible. Because once I start writing things down, I start getting attached and, and things just change and change. I, I think of it in terms of leaving all the windows and doors open. And if I remember it, then it's meant to stay. Mm. It just needs to stay really fluid for a long time. That's great. You must have a good yeah. memory. It's getting yeah. worse, but yeah. <laughs> Wow. That's amazing. Um, All right. Our next question is from Nabila. Uh, She says, as a reader and huge fan, I didn't think it could get much better than Bel Canto and Commonwealth. Then came the Dutch house. As I look at your books on my shelf right now, I wonder as a reader, what would be your favorite of your books and why? Oh, I can tell you. Uh, My favorite book is the one that I'm, well, is the one that I just finished um, or I'm finishing up right now. I have a collection of essays coming out 
Thanksgiving of this year, which is called These Precious Days. So with, that's the title of the Harper's piece, but there's a whole series of essays around that piece. I really only love the book that I'm working on. So you know, it's very close. I've got a novel in my head that I am almost ready to start writing that I've been thinking about for a long time. I love that book very, very much. The rest of them, I could care less. It's, it's so strange. Once a book is actually published, it's gone from me. Hmm. And I don't, it's like, I don't even remember. I always say I am a turtle crawling away from my eggs in the sand and I don't look back. And if they are eaten by birds or, you know, stepped on by tourists, or if they become little turtles and swim off into the sea, it doesn't make any difference. What does Suki think about being the subject of this piece? And it sounds like also the collection of essays. Well, she's not the subject of the whole collection, but it's the, the center of the collection. You know, it's, it's been really meaningful. Mm -hmm. And um, I talk to her about it every step of the way and let her read all of the drafts. And she's a very quiet, shy person. And this has been a really great way to be able to talk with her friends and her family about what's going on. Um, we actually had a long phone call tonight just before I came on and she was saying that the piece gave her a lot of confidence as an artist too, you know, mm -hmm. because I said, she just doesn't ever seem to hesitate. She just goes to the canvas and starts to paint. It's astonishing to me. And she said, well, you said that. So, so now it's true. <laughs> well, I go to the canvas and that is how I paint. She just sent me a new painting today, a picture of a new painting. It was like, oh my God, she's so brilliant. From Anne's mouth to Suki's brush. A new, uh, there's the cover for the book, These Precious Days, has one of her paintings on the front and the back. And they're also her paintings um, in Harper's Magazine. So if you go to the website, you can see them. Yeah, they're beautiful. Thank you. All right. Well, I have another question. Um, this one from Robin. I've recently read The Dutch House and loved it. I was moved especially by the theme of forgiveness in the most difficult of situations. I've struggled with this myself. Can you explore this theme a bit more with us? Um, forgiveness is forgiveness is just such a gift. And I think that when we're young, we think that forgiveness would be something that we would give to other people. And in fact, I think forgiveness is really a gift that we give to ourselves, which is just you're carrying this heavy burden of anger um, and hurt. And forgiveness means you're putting it down. Who does that benefit? It, it really benefits you. I mean, it, it surely benefits the other person as well. But the important thing is it, it really benefits us. So I went to Catholic school for 12 years. You know, I, I, I'm very deeply indoctrinated in ideas about forgiveness. I'm, I'm all about it. And also, I will say, the ability to forgive yourself is so huge. If you take nothing away from watching this Zoom tonight, I would like to give this to you as a present. Forgive yourself for everything. Everything. And, and that's what I do in my writing. Every day I sit down to write, and what I write is not nearly as good as I want it to be. I'm not as smart as I want to be. I'm not as talented as I want to be. The writing that I have produced is not as good as what's in my head, and I forgive myself. And that's how I go on. And so many people who want to write cannot forgive themselves for not being as good as they want to be. And you never will be as good as you want to be. You just, you're just as good as you are. And then you go on and you do it again the next day. So forgiveness, word of the day. Amen, sister. Love yeah. And, and unless, of course, unless, of course, you're voting 
to impeach the president. In which case, <laughs> all right. Next question. I've got to get that in. <laughs> That was great. <laughs> um, all right. This question's from Isabella. Uh, what has been the most influential force in your writing over the years? Something that obsesses you and you always come back to. Oh, that's a great, uh, thank you for wording it that way. Because that's, that is such a hugely important part of writing is figuring out what obsesses you. Um, Robert Olin Butler talks about writing from the white hot center of yourself which is figuring out what your truth is and, and what your interests really deeply are. And I will always be writing about class and race and wealth and poverty and the construction of family. And as much as I try not to write about those things, those are the things that come up again and again in my work. So yeah, those are, those are my obsessions. I, and I don't even, I don't even realize that they're my obsessions until I sit down to write. And then those are the things that always come up for me. Well, it's interesting that you said that just because, you know, you said you have to figure it out, but it almost sounds like it's figuring you out. It's true. I mean, it's not even figuring out as much as it is looking, paying attention, keeping, keeping yourself open to yourself. Um, I got a, I got a letter several months ago from a guy who was raking me over the coals because there, there weren't black characters in the Dutch house. And, you know, did I, did I feel it was a racist book? And did I feel that Danny was a racist character? And I was like, man, have you read my body? (laughs) Have you read my work? Um, And he said, no, I just read the Dutch house. And I was like, get out of here. Leave me alone. Growing that thick skin. Yeah, yeah fair. Really. Um, so this comes from Ryan. Uh, what are the first steps and hardest challenges of opening a bookstore? <laughs> um, boy, there are just things that you you can't even imagine. Um, the thing that it has so much to do with money. It has so much to do with your landlord. When people say to me, what are you doing now as a bookstore owner? You're so successful. What are you doing that bookstore owners in the past didn't do and they failed? It's like, what am I doing? I have a good landlord. Because what happens is that uh, bookstores have a fixed profit margin, right? The price of the book is stamped on the cover. You, You can only lower it. You cannot raise it. So for me to have a bookstore in Nashville versus someone having a bookstore on Fifth Avenue in New York versus someone having a bookstore in San Francisco or in Tupelo, Mississippi, you are selling the same book at the same price point and your rent is so shockingly different. So when people say, oh, all the little bookstores in New York, they're all gone. Amazon is so terrible. Yeah, well, Amazon is terrible. But that's not why all the little bookstores in New York are gone. They're gone because the landlord can make more money using that rental space as either a nail salon or a bank. So the the number one thing that you wouldn't think about opening a bookstore is to find a good landlord. Um, the, The other thing that I sure never knew is that you have to have, you, the owner, has to have an account with all of the publishers. Harper Collins, Penguin Random House, Simon and Schuster, Macmillan. I have to have an account with these people, and they have my personal financials, by which I mean the right to take my house. Okay? Like what you have to put up in order to get a line of credit, publishers. So it's a it's a really, really fascinating thing. A friend of mine, when I was first thinking about opening the store, a very wealthy friend of mine said, you're like a really good cook who thinks she should open a restaurant because she can cook. <laughs> and and there's, there's real truth in that. Like, I'm a really good reader. So, you, you know, I should open a bookstore because I love books and I love reading. And what you find at least in opening it, is it is it is really about uh, these 
very sort of base financial things and parking. What's it really about? It's about the ability to park your car so you can run in and get the homework book that your kid needs tonight. Because if you don't have a parking space, you're not going to go to that bookstore. Crazy stuff that has absolutely zero to do with literature. Wow. Wow. (laughs) That was incredibly. That was incredibly insightful. <laughs> that was great. Oh, well, glamorous, <laughs> Anne. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, well, maybe one of the um, on a note about the upsides of having a bookstore. Um, some people in the Q and A have talked about books you've recommended in various interviews, and I'm wondering if you could recommend a couple books for us tonight. Oh, I would love to. Okay, George Saunders. Also, yesterday. Um, the uncollected short stories of Alan Gerganis came out, which those are fantastic. Uh, if you like a deep, lush, rich, and complicated short story, there is a book coming out in February by Chang Ray Lee called My Year Abroad, which m- my problem as a reader is that I'm always reading books that aren't going to come out for months, but that is as far as I will go forward. I also really thought that was a spectacular book. It was sort of like great expectations, just just wonderful. A book that I finished yesterday was Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell, which is one of those books that was really reaching a critical mass for me that every single one of my friends was saying, Hamnet, 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 nothing is better than Hamnet. And I've been hearing it, the book has been out for, I don't know, like nine months or something. And I it's very hard for me to go backwards because for the store, I'm always reading things that are out. I, today, I just finished reading a brilliant Joan Silber book that will be out in May. That's how I read. Uh, so it was such a treat for me to read Hamnet. Um, two, some of my very favorite books of 2020, Ya Jesse's Transcendent Kingdom. I have no idea how it is that that wasn't just some explosively popular book. Her first book, Homegoing, which was a beautiful, amazing, ambitious book. To me, Transcendent Kingdom was so much better that it was almost, sometimes I feel like if somebody gets a slate of good reviews for one book, they think, well, we need to take her down a little bit for the second book. Read Transcendent Kingdom. Louise Erdrich's most recent book, the Night Watchman is my favorite Louise Erdrich book, and Louise Erdrich is my favorite writer. And Gish Jen had a book come out this year called The Resisters, which uh, is a spectacular novel that will make you want to throw your, um, what are those things called? Alexa, your Alexas away. Um, so those would be my... Throw my Alexa away, so it was perfect. <laughs> And I want to make sure, because a lot of people have asked, are, are all of the interviews that you do a, able to be accessed through Parnassus or, or are they just kind of all over the place? Because I know you 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 interviewed Louise for Book Passage and I highly recommend. I love seeing you interview other people and just how fun it is to find interviews that you give, but also interviews that you receive. So, Do you know, honestly, I have no idea. Because I do so many interviews on so many different platforms and and I don't ever look. I don't ever look. So if somebody hands me a waiver, I sign it and <laughs> I never look at anything. I don't know. Well, for people who are looking for Anne's other interviews, I will say because I spent all day yesterday and today doing this, they're easy to find on Google. You're all over Apple Podcasts. I mean, if if you want to just immerse yourself in Anne, that is possible. That really is a sickening thought um, <laughs> that anybody would do that. And also, it makes me feel so guilty, Brooks. That it's like I blew a day and a half of your life on oh this. Oh my program. goodness, it's the exact <laughs> opposite. Like, it was- yeah. My pleasure. It was so fun. And it, this does take us right up to the hour. So it's a great segue. I mean, really, I'm I'm deeply honored and really happy that I got to spend these last 30 hours with you. Um, and <laughs> as somebody who interviews people all the time, you're great at this. And oh, I'm so appreciative. I'm so appreciative that you 
went to all this trouble and that you were with me because you were a great company and a lot of fun. And Sparky. Let's bring Sparky back on oh, while I... Dog bed. So. Oh, he's in his dog bed. Okay. Well, what a cutie. Everybody, thank you. Thank you to Anne for joining us. And also, I want to mention to Point Reyes Books and the Bay Area Book Festival's Women Lit Series for bringing us together tonight. A shout out to my She Writes authors as well. I know a lot of you are out there. Thank you all for watching Women Lit Unbound. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. Shop local, everybody. Thank you. Right. Bye, Indy. Hashtag. Mm -hmm.